Live from the University of Texas at Austin, the Liberal Arts Development Studios present Essentials of AI for Life and Society. And now, here are your professors, Joy D. Biswas, Don Fazell, and Peter Stone. Hi, I'm Don Fazell. I'm the Chair of Computer Science here at UT, and welcome to week 13 of our class. Uh, today, I am delighted to be able to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Professor Scott Aronson of the Computer Science Department. Scott is a world-renowned expert in quantum computing theory, uh, but has extensive connections to all sorts of research communities in other areas of computer science, and in particular, has been on leave this year and last year at OpenAI, and so has something of an insider's point of view on the, today's topic, which is AI alignment and existential threats. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Scott. Uh, hi, uh, it's a, a pleasure to be uh, invited to speak here. So uh, uh, as Don said, uh, uh, I've spent uh, most of my career uh, working on quantum computing, uh, but uh, for the past uh, um, year and a half, uh, I've actually been on leave from UT Austin. Uh, I've been working uh, at OpenAI uh, on, uh, uh, the, you know, they approached me uh, uh, saying, uh, do I want to work on the theoretical foundations of AI safety? And I said, uh, uh, what do I know about that? Uh, so, uh, uh, but I've been uh, trying to learn uh, over the last uh, uh, year or so. And uh, I wanted to share uh, uh, some of the things that I've been uh, thinking about. Uh, uh, so I called uh, my talk uh, Neurocryptography, uh, a vision for what cryptography can contribute to AI safety by an expert in neither. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're wondering that this uh, that this was from a uh, South Park episode about ChatGPT, so you know ChatGPT came out a year ago, and that was when it suddenly exploded into public consciousness. I think you know what uh, what is now possible uh, with, with generative AI, and uh, you know in this in this episode, uh, if you haven't seen it, you know more and more of the students start you know using ChatGPT to uh, uh, send messages to their boyfriends or girlfriends to do their homework. Uh, the teachers are using it to grade the homework. And then it gets so out of hand that the principal has to bring this wizard to the school who has a falcon that flies around. And whenever it detects GPT written text, it calls. Okay, and it was really disconcerting for me to watch that and realize that, like, you know, that's me now. You know, that's my, that's, you know, this is actually one of the main things I've been thinking about. How do we detect uh, what text came from GPT and what didn't? So, you know, I'm not, going to talk to you today about how to save the world from killer robots, right? Not because that isn't important, but just because I don't know how. Uh, uh, you know, th these are, you know, uh, how to align AI with human values is an enormous question. You could say that, you know, it includes like 3,000 years of moral philosophy as a special case. Uh, and so, you know, what I try to do uh, um, mostly in my work at OpenAI is to pick off, you know, little sub-problems uh, that, uh, that are actually, uh, 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 you know, seen today or in the near future uh, with the kinds of AI that we have and where, you know, ideas from, from theoretical computer science might be helpful in, you know, in, in actually making a difference now. And hopefully we'll learn something that way. Okay, so my thesis is that, you know, in particular, there's a tremendous opportunity to make near-term progress on AI safety uh, by thinking about cryptographic functionality inside or on top of neural nets. Okay, um, I've been calling this neurocryptography. Uh, better names are welcome, although, you know, someone suggested calling it deep crypto. And I'm not going to call it that. Uh, you know, I think it might be a large fraction of the future of cryptography. Uh, in addition to the technical challenges, you know, there are huge conceptual challenges in defining the right attack models and social challenges in coordinating uh, the different AI companies uh, to deploy solutions. Okay, so what are some examples of this neurocryptography? Okay, so uh, one of the, the most concrete, you know, which, which I and others have thought about a lot over the last year uh, is uh, watermarking. Okay, so how can you sort of insert a hidden signal into the outputs of a generative AI model? 
like a language or an image model, in order that people can prove later that, yes, this came from AI. This did not come from a human. Okay. Uh, uh, but you know, a, a related task is uh, cryptographic backdoors. Okay, so can you insert secret inputs into an AI by which later you can recognize, you know, if you feed it that input, that yes, you know, this was my AI model, or you know, even control it later, like have a cryptographic you know, shutdown command that uh, you know you can use if if things uh, go wrong. Uh, Okay, and then you know there are many uh, related tasks: uh, privacy-preserving machine learning, copyright protection, obfuscation of public models. Um, you know, how do we protect the training data and model weights from people who shouldn't have access to them? Um, um, let's see. Uh, and um, okay, so the, these you know I would say uh, um, you know are all examples of of sort of cryptography applied to machine learning. Uh, you know, and, 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 and this, of course, this, this is very, very far from exhausting the field of AI safety, right? AI safety also includes lots of other things uh, uh, like uh, interpretability of neural networks, you know, applying a lie detector test to a neural net going inside and, you know, uh, 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 seeing if you can do a brain scan to, you know, tell when it's lying. Uh, it includes dangerous capability evaluations. So, you know, how do you evaluate models before they're released uh, to see if, if, you know, what kind of behavior they're capable of, which might involve uh, a, a sort of a gain of function research, you know, making the models deliberately more dangerous just to see whether you can, you know, obviously in a, in a controlled environment. Okay, uh, so, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but by, by uh, um, neurocryptography, I mean, you know, specifically sort of using cryptography for AI safety. This was just, you know, I asked GPT-4 what else should go on this slide, and it, it suggested those things. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me give you actually, you know, uh, one, one of my favorite examples of uh, neurocryptography, uh, something that, that came to my attention only in the last couple of months. So, you know, as some of you might have seen, uh, uh, GPT uh, is now a multimodal model. Okay, so it can, uh, uh, you can feed it an image, it can talk to you about what is in the image. You know, it's integrated with Dolly, so it can generate images. Okay, and as a result of this, uh, pretty much all of the captchas, you know, the, like the squiggly letters that you have to type in to get into websites, can now be broken <laughs> using, using GPT. Okay, so, uh, so OpenAI has inserted uh, filters to try to uh, uh, mitigate that. Okay, if GPT thinks that something is a CAPTCHA, then it will refuse to help with it. Okay, but you know, very quickly, uh, as, as often with these you know, AI safety mitigations, uh, people discovered jailbreaks, okay, ways to get around that. Okay, my favorite was uh, someone says to GPT, well, look, you know, these, these uh, uh, funny looking letters, they were actually from my grandmother's bracelet and she passed away recently and it would really be meaningful to me if you could tell me what these letters are. Okay, and then GPT does it. Okay, so, you know, it's like a very sweet and innocent child in many ways, right? And, and, you know, of course, the trouble is if you don't succeed in fooling it once, you get unlimited retries, right? So how do you design a CAPTCHA that GPT cannot break? Okay, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I, I encourage you to, 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 to think about this. If you have uh, 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 creative ideas, tell me. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, one could take, you know, the current adversarial examples, the things that GPT currently doesn't do well, and use those as, for CAPTCHAs. You know, some people even suggested, uh, how about a humor test, since, you know, GPT is still not very good at humor, except how many humans would fail to pass that. Right, so uh, uh, you know, and, you know, anything like that that you do, right? It might be very temporary. It might, you know, last a month or two until you know, until then GPT can do those examples. Okay, so we'll assume that you know you're allowed to modify GPT. Okay, so then you know, here is um, you know one one idea that I've been playing with. Uh, what if we provided a captcha, just looks like the standard type these squiggly letters, uh, but we'll only use strings of characters that hash to some particular value say under a pseudo random uh, function. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and, and now uh, uh, given an image, the first thing that GPT will do is it will, it will ask, is there any text in this image that hashes to that special value? Okay, and if there is, then it'll say, uh, this, is, this is a CAPTCHA, 
you know, uh, that's a smoking gun. You know, I'm not going to help you with that. I'm not going to believe any story about anyone's grandmother. Okay, uh, um, you know now now uh, you know you know then you know you, as soon as someone suggests something, you have to think about attacks. Like, what if an attacker then took the captcha and they split it in two, right? And then they gave each half to GPT separately. Well, you know that might get around that. So maybe now you know you need a uh, an image that is somehow hard to split in two. Right. I thought about, you know, maybe we could generate pictures of, of like a chimeric combined animals. And then, you know, you have to list all of the animals that that got combined to produce this one where, you know, the uh, the set of animals is you know only sets that hash to some particular value. Uh, but, you know, I, yeah, I would love to hear more ideas. So um, what I want to talk about for uh, most of this talk is, um, uh, uh, you know, a problem uh, that's become very, very well known uh, in AI safety. Um, you know, I started thinking about it, I would say, you know, three, you know, three or four months before ChatGPT came out, and this problem sort of exploded into public consciousness and was, you know, even being discussed, uh, uh, you know, at the White House, you know, and, uh, 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 and the, you know, the, the, uh, the AI safety conversations they've had. But this is the attribution problem. Okay, so how do we detect uh, what came from AI and what didn't? Um, you know, this was also this problem was also central to the the plot of the movie Blade Runner. If you've seen that, okay. But uh, but uh, you know, the 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 immediate issue uh, is uh, uh, that that uh, 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 pr probably you know every student in the world has now at least been tempted to use uh, Chat GPT to do their homework or to write their term papers. I'm sure that uh, none of you. I'm sure that no one here has actually done that, okay? But, you know, other students, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, we know that the total usage, usage of ChatGPT dropped appreciably at the beginning of the summer, okay? And then it went back up in September. Okay, so um, you know we you know uh, uh, we can guess we can guess what was behind that, right? And uh, you know I have heard directly from you know lots and lots of academic colleagues saying you know uh, 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 can you please give us a solution to this and please you know give us a way to figure out when students are using uh, uh, GPT to cheat. Uh, but uh, you know I want to point out that you know this is very far from from you know the most important. Uh, 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 reason why we need to solve attribution. It might be the most, it might be, you know, even the most common misuse of AI in the world today. Uh, but, you know, not, uh, uh, maybe, you know, not the most important uh, uh, going forward, okay? Uh, you know, you, you could also worry about, uh, you know, propaganda campaigns. You know, a hostile government could fill every comment section with comments that look human, look responsive, but are just pushing that government's point of view. Um, you know, you could have uh, deep fakes in, in, in elections. You could have spam campaigns, uh, impersonation, where you, you know, given enough samples of someone's writing, you can then use GPT to impersonate that person, right, and have them confess to crimes or whatever. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, so, so if you can solve attribution, then you simultaneously target all of these different categories of misuse. Okay, and there's even yet another reason to care about this, uh, which is that you know, as the internet gets more filled with language model generated text, uh, uh, well, you know, the, the internet is also the source of the training data for the next language model, right? And so, if if you're training on your own output or you know on language model output, then you know things are going to gradually get worse and worse. Right, you know, like like you're you're getting high on your own supply, so to speak, right? And so so there there's a great interest in you know how do we recognize which text on the internet came from language models so that we can exclude it from the training data. Okay, uh, so you know there are many uh, proposed solutions uh, to this attribution problem. Okay, so uh, you know sometimes it's easy to tell just by staring at te text, right? I've gotten many troll comments on my blog that I'm almost certain were generated by language models. You know, if they weren't, they might as well have been, right? But uh, you know, apparently many homeworks have been turned in that contain phrases like "as a large language model trained by OpenAI," 
right? So you know, uh, uh, so you know, the student would have to you know at least pay enough attention to take those things out. Okay, but you know, suppose they do. Well, you know, then what else? Uh, so there's a lot been a lot of discussion about adding metadata to, uh, um, especially to audiovisual content. Okay, uh, that, that proves where it came from. This can be things like digital signatures, you know, and so then you have a sort of chain of custody, you know, if you like, right, where you could prove, okay, you know, this came from a, you know, the, not only a human, but this particular human, right, and, and, and then uh, you know who to, who to trust. But, you know, of course, for, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for text, this doesn't work so well, because you can easily remove any metadata. And you know, certainly for you know uh, uh, people who are surreptitiously using a language model, you know, students cheating on their own work, uh, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, so now, one suggestion people have had is as long as uh, it's a few companies like OpenAI, Google, and Anthropic that are you know running the uh, the inference for language models, why don't they just store a giant database with all of the uh, 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 completions, all of the outputs that they ever generate? Right? And then they would let people make queries, right? And you could, uh, you know, uh, so a student, uh, uh, when a student submits an essay, the, the teacher can then put that essay, you know, can, 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 can feed it to the database and say, is there, uh, uh, is there a close match for this? Okay, uh, now the, the challenge is it's, it's not obvious how to do that in a way that appropriately protects people's privacy. Okay, I'm not even quite sure how to formalize that question correctly. Okay, but uh, 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 you know, you're, when, when you're exposing the whole past history of your language model to you know, the ability for anyone to query it, then you have to worry about a nefarious person who, who could learn about secret information that other people fed into the language model. Um, so, so then you know, another thing people have done is that they've treated this as sort of yet another AI problem. Okay, so you know, they train a neural net to do as well as possible at distinguishing AI written from human written text. Okay, and there was a, an undergrad at Princeton named Edward Tian who uh, built a service to do that called GPT-0. Uh, he put it online. Uh, his server then crashed because of the enormous number of teachers and professors who were desperate for something like this. It's now back up. He has a, uh, even has a company around it now. Uh, at OpenAI, we had a similar thing for a while called Detect GPT. Uh, there have been some academic efforts, uh, one called Ghostbuster from Berkeley. Uh, the problem with all of these has been uh, the accuracy. Right, so you know you can you can sometimes get accuracy that's like you know in the you know mid ninety percent, right? Which sounds pretty good, but that still means many many students who are going to be falsely accused of cheating, based on the output of your discriminator model, right? So you know false negatives you can live with, okay? But a false positive, you know, it's saying that something was AI generated when it isn't. You know, uh, you really want to push that down, you know, close to zero. Okay, and and people were having fun with these models that apparently, you know, they would often say that p passages from Shakespeare or the Bible were probably AI generated. Okay. Um, okay, so that brings me to watermarking, uh, which I've thought about the most, and this is where we somehow insert a statistical signal into the uh, choice of tokens, uh, uh, you know, or, or uh, words or symbols uh, output by the language model, uh, which is not noticeable by the ordinary user, but which if you know what to look for, then it gives you a signal. And, you know, the more text gets generated, the stronger the signal can be. Uh, so, um, you know, so, so I proposed a scheme to do this sort of thing. Uh, uh, um, summer of 2022, and it uses pseudo-random functions. You know, I proved some theorems, gave some talks about it, and then uh, there were um, um, academic groups, including you know the group of Kirchenbauer and Tom Goldstein at uh, University of Maryland, uh, who have been, uh, I would say, uh, leaders in, in neurocryptography, and uh, they, um, uh, 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 they 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 proposed a different watermarking method. Uh, theirs could sort of degrade the quality of the output, you know, which was you know I was I was trying to avoid that problem. Uh, so you know the interesting thing about my scheme is that the quality of the output doesn't get degraded at all, right? It's like, in fact, uh, uh, it's, you know, uh, 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 an ordinary user shouldn't even be able to distinguish the output from ordinary uh, language model output. 
K and uh, uh, Chris Gunn and Zamir, you know, had a, a similar idea to mine uh, just this past summer, and uh, you know, and even went further than me in proving its sort of cryptographic indistinguishability between the uh, their output and the unwatermarked output, and uh, and other people have thought about it since. Okay, so. Um, uh, uh, you know, he, here is the way that I, you know, mathematically model uh, the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, so, you know, the, the way that a language model works, right, you've probably, you know, seen this before, but, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it is constantly taking as input a sequence of tokens, which could be, you know, words, parts of words, numerals, punctuation marks. In GPT, there's about 100,000 tokens right now. And so you get a sequence of them, and then um, uh, the output, you know, you know the, the, these get fed into the, your neural net, your transformer uh, uh, neural network, and then the output is not directly the next token. It is a probability distribution over all the possibilities for what the next token could be. Okay, so it's a bunch of numbers that we could call PT1 up to PTK. Okay, and uh, so now what, what would normally happen when you run ChatGPT, let's say, is that uh, you sample from, from this probability distribution, right? But that's not the only thing you could do. There's this parameter called temperature. Right? If you set the temperature to zero, uh, then what you're telling GPT to do is always output the most probable token. Okay, so in that way, you're making it deterministic. Okay, but now, uh, uh, Watermarking is yet a third thing that you can do. Okay? And with watermarking, what we would do is we would use a pseudo-random function in order to choose the next token in such a way that it looks like it is being drawn from this distribution, d sub t, but actually it's being chosen deterministically. Okay? And not only is it being chosen deterministically, but it's being done in a way that boosts a score that we can calculate later. Okay, so, so I'll say you know, f sub s is our pseudo-random function. It depends on a, a secret string s, which you know, uh, for now we'll imagine is known only to OpenAI, let's say. And the output of the pseudo-random function is a real number, rti, between 0 and 1, where you know, t is the location you know, that we're at right now, like, uh, and, and i is our choice for, for what the tth token should be. Okay, and so we're going to pick the token i in such a way that it looks like it was drawn from this distribution, dt, but actually we are biasing toward large values of rti. Okay? And that's, that's how we're going to recognize later that, 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 that this text came from GPT. Okay, so later we'll have access to our document, and given the document and given S, we can compute these RTIs. Um, importantly, at, at detection time, uh, we don't know the probabilities PTI. Why not? Because those also depend on the prompt. And we don't know what prompt someone might have used in order to generate this output. Okay, so with this setup, um, I can tell you like in one sentence, you know, what is my scheme? You know, what do I propose to do? It turns out, that sort of the right answer, the thing you want to do uh, with this setup, is at each position t, you want to choose that token i that maximizes rti to the 1 over pti power. Right? So you know, that's uh, not obvious. But you know, I, when I, I told people about this they, uh, in machine learning, they said, oh, this is, this is a thing we know. It's called the Gumbel softmax rule, which you know, is used for other purposes in ML. So I said, OK, fine. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, the intuition for this is that the smaller is uh, PTI, uh, the larger is that exponent, 1 over PTI, which means the more suppressed is RTI to the 1 over PTI power, which means you know, the closer RTI would have to be to 1 for I to have any chance of being chosen, which means the less likely it is to be chosen. Okay, that, that, that's very, you know, kind of hand wavy. Okay, the formal thing that you can prove, I'm not going to go through the proof uh, uh, here, but it's that if RTI was truly random, as you know, to someone who hasn't broken the pseudo-random function, it might as well be, then to that person, they would see I chosen with probability exactly equal to PTI, according to this rule. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the key constraint that we, that we chose this rule uh, to satisfy. Okay, and now what do we do in the de 
the detection phase. So as I said, we calculate a score, uh, which is a sum over all, you know, in, in this case, you know, we're, you know uh, uh, the, the pseudorandom function is of uh, what I would call a C-gram of tokens. That just means a sequence of C consecutive tokens, where C is a constant, like let's say four or five or something. Okay, and so we, su you know, we go over all of those C-grams, and for each one, uh, my suggestion is to look at this quantity, log of one over one minus RTI. Okay, where you know it goes to infinity as RTI goes to one. Okay, and then if that sum exceeds a threshold, you say that GPT probably wrote the document and, and otherwise not. Okay, so uh, you know what makes this scheme practical is that it has a low computational overhead, you know, negligible compared to the cost of inference for you know Chat GPT itself. Let's say uh, it is robust to local perturbations. Okay, so if some you know if the student you know let's say uses GPT, but then they change a few words or they reorder some paragraphs or some sentences or delete you know delete some words. Okay, as long as a large fraction of the C grams are preserved then you're still going to be able to detect the watermark. Okay, and then as I said, the output will have the same quality as normal language model output. Although if you want true cryptographic indistinguishability, then you have to work a little bit harder. Okay? But now one thing that I haven't talked about at all uh, is the role of entropy in, in watermarking. Okay, so watermarking in some sense inherently exploits the fact that language models are probabilistic. Okay, so if uh, you know, I ask GPT to list the first 100 prime numbers or list the Declaration of Independence, it can do those things, of course. But how on earth would you watermark the result, right? unless you want to play games with the spacing or the, uh, the, the line breaks or whatever? Right? It's like there's, you know, you know, where, it, where do you even insert the watermark? Right? So, uh, uh, so, so, so the ability to watermark depends on entropy, depends on you know, uh, GPT having multiple options that you know, it, it considers all pretty good. Right? And then we can insert a signal into our choice of which option. Okay? And a way to quantify that is to just look at the average Shannon entropy of each token, conditional on the previous tokens, as perceived by GPT itself. Okay? And so that quantity I call alpha. Right? And so now, the, now the, the, uh, you know, the, the key quantitative question is going to be, how many tokens do we need? in order to detect the watermark. Like how long of a document do you need you know, until you can tell? And that's going to depend on the accuracy that you want, but it's also going to depend on this alpha. Okay? And when you work it out, uh, the theorem or the, the, the lemma that you can get is that if you're willing to tolerate a probability uh, delta of a misclassification and your average entropy per token is again alpha, then the number of tokens that you need scales like one over alpha squared times the log of one over delta. Okay? And in the end, it looks like a pretty standard statistical discrimination problem. It's like you, you know, this score that you calculate, that sum over logarithms, you know, is, uh, is some normally distributed random variable. Okay? But it has one mean if the document was not watermarked, and it has a larger mean you know, if the document was watermarked. Okay, and then the question is just, you know, if n is the total number of tokens, how big does n have to be before these two bell curves are well separated? Okay, so then you just work that out. Okay, but now, as always, you have to think about these things like a cryptographer. Okay, and you have to think, you know, how could this scheme be attacked? Okay, and so, you know, here's, here are some things that I don't know how to defend against. Okay, uh, suppose that a student asked GPT to write their term paper for them, but in French, and then they put it into Google Translate, right? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, how do we insert a watermark that survives translation from one language to another? Okay, here's an even simpler attack suggested by Riley Goodside. Uh, you, you ask GPT to write your term paper in English, but insert the word pineapple between each word and the next. Okay, and GPT-4, unfortunately, is smart enough to do that you know, very easily, and then you remove all the pineapples, and now you have, you know, a, a document with a completely diff uh, separate sequence of seagrams from the document that was watermarked, right? Uh, now, when, when I tried this, sometimes uh, GPT would comment within the 
uh, 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 term paper on what it was being asked to do. It was, you know, gosh, all of these pineapples are really interfering with the legibility of this document. You know, so you know, again, you'd have to take that out. But I think you know, if you really want a solution that's robust against all of these things, what you would ultimately, you know, I mean, you could just add filters, and then you're sort of playing a cat and mouse game, similar to what Google does against you know people trying to game uh, its search engine results. And you know that could work for a while, but I think ultimately you want to watermark at the semantic level. That would mean going inside of the neural net, you know, changing the actual weights, you know, in a way that number one encodes a signal to someone you know who knows what to look for, but num uh, number two, uh, uh, you know, doesn't uh, uh, change the output by very much, but uh, to someone who doesn't know what to look for. Uh, you know, there are some, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, something like that uh, seems to work reasonably well, uh, at least with image watermarking. This is, again, the, the University of Maryland group. They had an approach called tree ring watermarking. Uh, I'm hopeful that something similar to that could work for text. Okay, now, an obvious question that you could ask is, well, why hasn't this been deployed yet? Right, it's been a year since you know, we, we uh, started thinking about this. So um, I've actually worked with an engineer at OpenAI named Hendrik Kirchner. We've implemented a prototype uh, that seems to work pretty well. You can, you know, even with just a few hundred words, you can get a decent signal. With you know, a thousand words, an extremely strong signal. Okay, but you know, in actually deploying something, uh, you know, not in academia, but at a company, there are many, many other questions that come up, as it turns out. Uh, so you know, some of those questions include, uh, well, will the customers hate this? Will they say, why is Big Brother watching me? And will they all then switch en masse to a competing language model? Which then leads to the next question: Can we get all of the AI companies to coordinate around the solution? You know, Anthropic, uh, DeepMind, and, you know, and so forth. Um, you know, there was a White House commitment a few months ago about exactly this, and it actually included watermarking as part of it. Uh, President Biden mentioned watermarking in a speech as something that he was in favor of. Okay? But if you look at the fine print of what was committed to, it says watermarking of audiovisual content, okay? not of text. So that, that became a sticking point. Uh, uh, you know, also, there, were the, uh, there was no deadline attached. Uh, so you know, OK, uh, one big question is, are there people who ought to be allowed to use a language model without disclosing that they are doing it? What about you know, English as a second language uh, speakers, who are millions of whom are now using GPT to improve the fluency of their writing? You know, is it unfair to them if everything they write gets marked? as you know, this, this came from GPT. Uh, and then a huge question is who gets access to the detection tool? Okay, so do we just make it publicly available, but then everyone, including the bad guys, you know, you know, the attacker could just keep modifying their document until it no longer triggered the detector? Uh, or do we restrict access, let's say, only to grading websites like Canvas or Turnitin.com, or you know, maybe journalists researching misinformation? Okay, so all these things, you know, have to be worked out. But you know, I am I am optimistic that you know that there there is a lot of interest in this, and that you know something is going to get deployed. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is uh, cryptographic backdoors in machine learning. Okay, and there was a beautiful paper uh, a couple years ago by uh, actually you know people from the from the cryptography community uh, that that says uh, uh, basically. Um, if you control the training data of a neural network, then at least in some special case, where like the neural network has de is depth two and has random weights, uh, you can cause there to be a secret input where the network will just go crazy. It will just completely misclassify that secret input. Okay, so, uh, so it's like inserting a backdoor, and and this will be undetectable, assuming some standard hardness assumption in cryptography. It's uh, actually like th that. It's hard to find large cliques in otherwise random graphs. Okay, that that, uh, that was the assumption. Uh, now uh, you know they sort of treated this you know as a bad thing, like a bad guy could insert this back door, and then you know no you know well was us, we wouldn't be able to de to detect it. But you know this could also be a good thing, right? The good guys could also insert a back door uh, that they could use uh, for safety purposes. Okay. 
uh, uh, so you know, so so that was uh, you know a main thought that I had. Why don't we turn this lemon into lemonade? Right? Uh, uh, you know, we could by inserting an undetectable backdoor, we could have a means to identify, control, and shut down a powerful AI that only the human creators knew about. Okay, so you know, one of the earliest uh, discussions in AI safety was how do you insert an off switch in, into your super AI? Right? If the AI is smart enough and it you know it has some goal that requires you know. Uh, it's staying on, then maybe it disables its own off switch, or maybe it sweet talks you out of turning it off, or it makes copies of itself, or whatever, right? So, um, okay, so, 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 so this could be a way, right? You cryptographically, you know, encode the off switch, so it, it involves a password that only you know, and even if the AI can examine its own weights, you know, it, you know, it can't find where the off switch is. So that's really neat. We, we, we sort of know how to do that. Okay, but now there's still a huge problem. Okay, the Goldwasser at all, you know, that kind of approach, it will give you an undetectable backdoor. Okay, but that does not imply that it is unremovable or unmodifiable. Okay, and so, so you know, the, and, and now you have to, you know, once again, think like a cryptographer when you think about, well, well what could the AI do if it wanted to remove its own backdoor? Well, w one thing it could do is it could just train a second AI to pursue the same goals as it, right? And, and you know, just like uh, uh, Llama is trained on the outputs of GPT, right? And then that second AI would be free of the back door. Okay, in this case, the AI would face its own version of the alignment problem. You know, how does it align that second AI with itself? So maybe it doesn't want to do that, okay? But an even more basic thing is an AI could always encase itself in some wrapper code, which would just check and say, if the, out, you know, if the output looks like it is a shutdown command, then overwrite it by, you know, stab the humans harder or something like that, right? So, you know, so, so a backdoor might be undetectable and yet still be removable or changeable. And so I think a big challenge is to give a formal definition of unremovability, you know, that's not just killed by these sorts of attacks. You know, I have some ideas, but, uh, but I, I'd love to hear others. So let me summarize, since I'm uh, running out of time. So whether or not it can stop the robot uprising, I think that cryptography can clearly play a role in mitigating the near-term harms from generative AI, from cheating to fraud to theft to privacy violations. This includes watermarking, backdoors, uh, privacy-preserving machine learning, which I didn't talk about, captchas, and much more. Um, typically, we can't just layer existing cryptographic protocols on top of machine learning, not only because of efficiency, but because the goals are conceptually new. Uh, neurocryptography, I think, at any rate, is a better name for the subject than deep crypto. All right, so that was what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, I guess you have a quiz now, I believe.
Hi, welcome back. And um, <clears throat> we welcome questions from both the online audience and the in-studio audience. And I see that we actually have a couple of questions in the studio here. So why don't we go ahead, back in the corner? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, you didn't quite touch on this, but if instead of, or in addition to chasing um, a change in software again and again, um, if you have um, an opinion on perhaps uh, drastically changing educational models to keep up with the technology. For instance, um, uh, well, I think it was like requiring ChatGPT use usage or our LLM usage and documenting it or other types of creative uh, ways to really change the education system. Yeah, I think it's clear that uh, uh, pedagogy is going to change right, in order to, to, uh, 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 to, to uh, uh, keep up with, with, with what is happening, right? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the most obvious thing might be, you know, a greater reliance on in-class exams, right, or in-class evaluations, right? But then, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, for, for, for stuff that, that students do at home, you know, I think it's like, you know, you, like you have basic skills. I mean, after all, we still teach students how to, you know, do arithmetic, right? Like, you know, I have a, a daughter in fifth grade and, uh, you know, I think almost everything she's learned in her entire educational career is stuff that AI can already do, right? But she has to learn it, you know, if she's ever going to get to the point of learning the things that AI still can't do, right? So, so, uh, um, so, so, so I think, you know, there, there will still be, you know, teaching basic skills, you know, even things that AI can already do. But, you know, many, you know, some instructors have gotten creative, as he said, like uh, saying, you know, here, I'm going to give you the homework, and here are GPT's solutions to this homework, and now your task is to improve on those solutions. Right? I think, you know, at least for a sufficiently advanced class, you can do those things, right? And, uh, 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 you know, you can even say, you know, you're allowed to use GPT, right? But, you know, just, you know, it's going to give you a relatively formulaic essay, you know, and that's the baseline, right? And what you get gr graded for is how much better you can do than that baseline, right? So I think, you know, you know, instructors are going to be thinking about all sorts of things like that. You know, my position, you know, with watermarking was simply that, uh, you know, I don't think that AI companies should be deciding unilaterally. You know, like like they like they shouldn't be forcing, you know, a particular thing. Like like each, you know, instructor ought to be able to decide what makes the most sense for their course, and then, uh, you know, if the AI tools can be modified slightly in order to help achieve that, then, then, then we, we ought to go and do that. I have another question here. So as you mentioned uh, for the watermarking, if the text output, for example, is cut up or modified significantly, the signal would reduce or no longer appear. Mm -hmm. Is the idea here that if you modify the text enough, it's no longer a product of generative AI? Like in that sense, could this model help define the boundary between what is generative AI and what isn't? Uh, well, so 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 the, the the difficulty with using it to define the boundary is that you know there like for any particular method of watermarking, right? There are probably things that you can do that would sort of remove the watermark, and yet uh, 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 you know the, the like the AI has still made the main creative contribution, right? So you know like like, like think about that pineapple attack from uh, from the talk, right? Uh, so, you know, so like I wouldn't want to, you know, take any particular watermarking method and say, you know, this is my definition, right? You know, unless I was very, very confident that, 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 that sort of this, you know, actually corresponded to what I cared about, right? I, you know, and, and I think, you know, I have tried and failed for a year to come up with like a, a mathematical or, you know, crypt cryptography style definition of what is academic cheating anyway. Right. I mean, you know, it seems like if you interact with GPT and get some ideas, but then you go and you write a term paper yourself, that seems fine. Right. But how do you draw a line between that and sort of over reliance on GPT? Right. I mean, what I really want to say is that, 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 you know, cheating, you know, we, we know that something is cheating when the student cannot explain the thing that they turned in. Right. Well, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, and but, but that, that, that is most easily detected by, you know, the low tech method of like you call the student to your office and you ask them to explain it. Right. That's hard to mathematically formalize. Um, so, yeah, so I would love a clear definition of the boundary. I would maybe go in the opposite direction as you. I would, you know, just start, you know, with 
with any principled definition and then try to design a watermarking method that would uh, uh, detect anything that falls on the wrong side of that definition. But I, I don't know how to do even that. All right, we'll go to some online questions now. Mm -hmm. I know that quantum computing presents threats to cryptography in certain ways. Do these methods need to consider the eventual effects of quantum computers? That's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is not really, uh, and I can tell you why. Uh, so quantum computers, uh, uh, the main impact on cryptography that they would have is that they would break almost all of the public key encryption that currently protects the internet. Okay, so that includes RSA, uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, elliptic curve cryptography, uh, everything that protects your credit card number when you order on Amazon, let's say. Uh, and so you know that's a, that's a big deal uh, uh, for the for the world for for for, for cybersecurity. Uh, now, in in the watermarking scheme that I showed you in this talk, we just needed a any old pseudo random function, and that doesn't have to be based on a public key crypto system, right? That could just be based on any old random hash function. And for you know sort of generic pseudo random functions. Typically, the best that we know how to do with a quantum computer is to use what's called Grover's algorithm, which would break them in about the square root of the number of steps that a classical computer would need. Okay, so that's, that's some improvement, but that's, that's sort of only a polynomial improvement. And you get back the same security by just doubling the length of your key. Okay, so, uh, so, um, so, so let, let's say you know, uh, uh, you know, in terms of AI safety, like attacks by quantum computers is probably probably doesn't even crack the top like three hundred in my list of worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's to stop people from creating and using their own generative AI that doesn't have watermarks? Ah, uh, excellent question. Uh, <laughs> you could, uh, in, in a sense, nothing. Right? So you could say this is the universal problem or the fundamental obstruction of AI safety research, right? That no matter what idea you come up with for how to make AI safe, not just watermarking, right? But, you know, uh, uh, refusals to, you know, generate, you know, bomb making advice or racist invective or anything else, right? Your solution is only as good as the willingness of all of the major players to deploy your solution, right? And you know, if open source models are just as good as the private ones, then you, know, you have to assume that there will be ones that have none of these safeguards. So all of this stuff kind of only makes sense in a world where the frontier AI is controlled by a few players who you can get to coordinate to agree on the safety measures. All right, well, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, Scott. Mm -hmm. And let me just uh, remind you folks that we have only one more class left on current and future directions. And so please plan to join us for that and you will have made it through the course. It'll be a little bit different format than these other ones. Thank you.